Hi, this is Michael Altos, and welcome to Pharmacology for Certified Anesthesiologist Assistants. We're starting with a module on the fundamentals of clinical pharmacology, and this is recording part one. When we talk about pharmacology, we divide it into two different branches, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, and we're going to talk about each of those in this module. We will start with pharmacokinetics. Pharmacokinetics is simply what the body does to the drug. How does the concentration in the blood vary with the dose that you give or with the time that's elapsed since you gave the dose? And pharmacokinetics has a lot of different steps. It starts with absorption of the drug into the body. Then the drug is distributed and redistributed to different tissues. It has to be transferred or transported to the site of action of that drug. <clears throat> Once the drug has had its action, it also undergoes metabolism or biotransformation, and finally, elimination from the body. Let's start with absorption. How does the drug get into the body? There are many different routes of administration that we can use for giving drugs. And one of the things that we need to think about is the term bioavailability. Bioavailability is the relative amount of drug that you gave which actually reaches the systemic circulation. So you may take a pill with a thousand milligrams of Tylenol in it, but how much of that Tylenol actually gets into the bloodstream and to the target organ? Well, if I give the drug IV, the bioavailability is always one, it's a hundred percent, because all of the drug that I give goes straight into the bloodstream. And that's true for any parenteral dosing. Parenteral means it doesn't go through the GI tract, so it would be usually IV or intramuscular dosing. Let's take just a moment and look at the simulation here. In this simulation, we're talking about bioavailability or oral availability. We don't give a lot of drugs orally in anesthesia, but we still need to understand this concept. Here we see a drug being given into the stomach, and the drug is being absorbed out of the stomach and out of the intestines into the splanchnic circulation, into the portal vein, and it's going to the liver. And the liver isn't really doing very much with this drug, and so the drug passes through the liver and to the vena cava and then to the heart, and then it's pumped around the body. This drug has 100% oral availability. But suppose the liver starts to engage in what we call first-pass metabolism we see that now the liver is getting a lot of the red drug, but it's only giving a little bit of it back to the bloodstream. The liver is metabolizing a lot of the drug before it ever makes it to the systemic circulation. And here we would say that the oral availability is relatively low, and the bioavailability is less than one, or less than 100%. Obviously, if the drug is not well absorbed in the GI tract, then you can see the drug is passing all the way through the GI tract and only a little bit of it is absorbed. So that can also affect bioavailability. Here we see the same thing in more detail. Here's drug in the intestines being absorbed into the liver and then passed into the systemic bloodstream. And as hepatic metabolism rises, we can see that the liver still gets a lot of drug, but it metabolizes most of it and only passes a little bit on to the systemic bloodstream. So you need to make sure you are familiar with this topic of first-pass metabolism. The idea that some drug is metabolized before it ever reaches its systemic circulation or its target site. And usually when we talk about first-pass metabolism, we're talking about the liver. And this is really significant for enteral administration. That's something that goes through the GI tract, so oral or sometimes rectal administration. But just to be perfectly technically accurate, any time a drug is metabolized before it gets to its target, that's called first-pass metabolism. So for example, we inject fentanyl into a vein. It never sees the liver. It goes straight from the vein into the vena cava, into the heart. Then it goes through the lungs and then into the left side of the heart and then distributes to the body. But it turns out some of the fentanyl is actually taken up and metabolized in the lung. So in a sense we have a first pass metabolism there as well. The same could be said about uh, succinylcholine. 
which we administer into a vein and it pumps around the body and then goes to the neuromuscular junctions. But the metabolism of succinylcholine occurs in the blood itself. It occurs by plasma esterases in the blood. So we could say that there's actually a first pass metabolism for that drug as well. Speaking more about different routes of administration, we've already mentioned IV and intramuscular, oral and rectal. Another route is the sublingual route. That's when you take the drug and place it under your tongue and it's absorbed through the mucosa of the mouth. This has an advantage because it goes directly into the venous system and this you may see done with nitroglycerin or fentanyl and since it goes into the superior vena cava it avoids the liver and the portal circulation so you won't get any hepatic first pass effect. There are still many other routes of administration. The transcutaneous which means giving it through the skin subcutaneous, which is injecting it under the skin, intramuscular we mentioned already, which is a little bit slower than IV, but a reliable way to give medication. And then we can inject drugs into the CSF, into the intrathecal space, the epidural space. We can give drugs around a nerve as an injection. Of course, we can inhale drugs as well. So many different routes of administration for our drugs. So that's absorption. Once the drug is absorbed into the body, it is distributed around the body. When we talk about cardiac output, which we'll discuss in more detail in the physiology curriculum, we can think of the body as being made up of four different tissue groups. We have our vessel-rich group, which consists of the brain and the kidneys, and of course our central compartment circulation. Then we have our muscle group, our fat group, and then what we would call the vessel pore group, which would be like maybe your bones and things like that. If you look at these four groups, they each make up a different percentage of body weight and get a different percentage of cardiac output. So the vessel rich group only makes up about 10% of your body weight, but it gets 75% of the cardiac output. Again, these are important tissues like your liver, your brain, your kidneys and so on. Your body is about 50% muscle by weight, but it only gets about 20% of cardiac output. So we expect it will take longer for a drug to be distributed to these tissues. And then fat and finally the vessel pore group. It's important for us to know that lipophilic drugs equilibrate rapidly into CNS, into nervous system tissue. This is going to be important for us because our anesthetic drugs work in the CNS tissue. Let's explore this a little bit more. When I give a single dose of a lipophilic drug, a lipid soluble drug, it very quickly has an effect in the CNS. And then after a short time, the dose wears off. Why is this dose wearing off? If I give a dose of propofol and the patient wakes up after a few minutes, have they metabolized the propofol? The answer is no. What they have done is redistribute the propofol to peripheral tissues or peripheral compartments. This is a very well-known graph that you should understand uh, very well. Here we see a drug being given and at the initial time point 100% of the drug is in the plasma because that's where we injected it. Over the course of the first minute the plasma levels drop to a very tiny percentage. Only about 10% of the drug remains in the plasma. Where has it gone? Well, it's left the plasma and gone into the vessel-rich group. It's gone to the brain, the kidneys, the liver, and so on. So within a minute, we see a very high peak effect of this drug. And that's what we see when we give, for example, a dose of propofol. But it doesn't last for long. And by the end of 10 minutes, the drug has basically left the vessel-rich compartment. And the patients can start to wake up from that drug. Where has the drug gone? It hasn't been eliminated but slowly it's been, trans, uh, it's been redistributed once again and transported into the muscle-rich group, which gets less cardiac output, and so it takes longer for it to achieve this peak effect. Maybe it takes about 10 minutes. And then finally, we have the fat group, which gets the least cardiac output, and so therefore it takes the longest time for drug to build up in that group. So that's what happens with a single dose. What if I gave a dose of propofol every two minutes? Well, as I keep giving multiple doses, I keep re, uh, restoring this plasma tissue, this plasma concentration, 
and it will keep distributing drugs into all of these compartments and the compartments will start to fill up a little bit they'll start to saturate with this drug that we're giving and so the drug won't move quite as easily from the plasma to the vessel rich group because it's getting filled up it won't move quite as easily from the vessel rich group to the other groups because they're getting filled up and it will make the drug look like it has a longer duration of action at some point you've given enough drug that when these plasma levels drop it's not because of redistribution it actually there is no more place for it to redistribute to and at that point plasma levels start to drop based on elimination which we'll discuss in a few minutes some drugs many drugs when they are in the bloodstream are bound to protein protein bound drugs can't be taken up by an organ they can't be taken up by the kidneys for excretion and the protein that binds most of our drugs is albumin it binds most acidic and neutral drugs and some basic drugs as well the second most common protein is called alpha-1 acid glycoprotein which binds most basic drugs so if a patient has very low protein levels let's say they're malnourished or have some chronic illness then they have less protein available to bind to drug they have more free drug in the circulation which means that they'll have more activity and more of a kick from any given drug that we administer once a drug has gotten to its target site it needs to be transferred or transported into the cell or to its target receptor we know that cells are surrounded by a cell membrane which is a lipid bilayer and small lipophilic drugs can slide right across that bilayer easily there are also different transmembrane proteins which make a hydrophilic channel so that hydrophilic drugs can also slide across the membrane and this is true in most cells except in the CNS where the hydrophilic drugs need some sort of active transport that we'll discuss in just a moment first passive transport is when drug moves naturally down its concentration gradient and as fast as we can deliver blood flow to the target organ that's as quickly as we can deliver drug to its target receptor inside the cell facilitated diffusion means that you need some sort of a carrier protein that allows the drug to go across the cell membrane but there's no energy requirement and this is compared with active transport where you also need a carrier protein but it actually uses energy in order to transport the drug molecules and this would work even against a concentration gradient when you're trying to pump more drug into a high concentration area at this point we need to take a moment and talk about acid base chemistry this is a very quick refresher on some basic principles of acid base that we will use to understand different drugs and how they transport around the body first let's define an acid an acid is simply a molecule that can lose a proton and become negatively charged a base is a substance that can gain a proton and become positively charged you need to know these definitions when I take these different substances and put them in an acidic environment that means there's an excess of hydrogen ions these equations are driven to the right so we see that an acid in an acidic environment will be uncharged a base in an acidic environment will become positively charged and in a basic environment these equations go in the opposite direction why do we care about all this well charged species anything that's ionized doesn't cross membranes very well and most drugs work best when they're non ionized so how do we determine if an environment is an acidic environment or a basic environment the answer is the acidity or the basicity is relative to the to the uh, characteristics of the individual molecule and that's determined by the pKa the pKa is very simply the pH where ionization occurs I like to think of it as the 50 50 point the pKa is the pH where half of the species is non ionized and half of it is ionized so if the pKa of a molecule is 6 and the pH is 2 which is much more acidic then the excess protons in the acidic environment drive the equation to the right 
But if the pKa of the drug is 6 and the pH is 7.4, we call that a relatively basic environment compared to the pKa, and the equation is driven to the left in order to replenish the deficit of hydrogen ions. Let's look at a couple examples to understand this better. Midazolam, or Versed, it's a base, and there's no way for you to know that except if you are able to analyze the molecular structure or read it in a textbook. So I'm telling you that midazolam is a base, and we know that its pKa is 6.2. The pH of blood is 7.4. So is midazolam in an acidic or a basic environment? Well, the environment is the blood, and the blood has a higher pH than the pKa. So the blood is a relatively basic environment compared to the midazolam's pKa. What happens in a basic environment? The equation is shifted towards the protons, towards the left, and therefore most of the midazolam should be non-ionized. And in fact, we see that midazolam is about 94% non-ionized in the blood, which makes it able to cross lipid membranes easily. Propofol is an acid, and we would use this equation to analyze it. It has a pKa of 11, which means it is 50% uh, ionized and 50% non-ionized at that very high pH. The pH of blood is still 7.4, and so blood is an acidic environment relative to the pKa. An acidic environment has an excess of protons, and we think of this equation as pushing to the right. Once again, we have a non-ionized species, and in fact, propofol is about 99% non-ionized in the blood. We can take a quick look at the simulation. And here we see the process that I just described. Here's a membrane. Here we see the equation for an acid, which can dissociate into a negatively charged species and a proton. And here what I'm going to do is add some acid to the left side. And we can see how adding acid to one side pushes the equation to the other side. It pushes the equation to the right. Each hydrogen ion mixes with an anion to form a neutral species, and the neutral species are what can cross the membrane. If we have a basic environment, think of a basic environment as taking away hydrogen ions. And so what that's doing is pushing this equation instead to the left. That's it for this first recording. Please do take time to review these important concepts and be in touch with me if you have any questions or need anything clarified. We'll certainly discuss it in class and we'll continue with the next recording.